Well, hello, show buddies, and welcome back to the channel. It's Thanksgiving weekend, and it's time to do some coastal crafting. Let's dive in. As you can see, I have my other helper back here today. She's usually sort of camera shy and doesn't like to be in the videos the way Buddy does. He's down on the floor taking a nap. Mercifully. <laughs> Not that easy to craft with a puppy dog trying to hit your arm while you're operating a glue gun. <laughs> oh, that's Buddy though and we love him. Anyway. Welcome to the Coastal Crafting Edition of what we did with our Eclipse shells. So today, we're going to have some really fun times. First of all, we're going to identify all those awesome shells that we found out at Shell Key and out at Sunset Beach on the day of the Eclipse. Then, we're going to take some shells and we're going to make three really cool projects that you can do easily, you can accomplish fairly simply. This is not a an expert level crafting video or anything like that. This is to wet your feet a little bit, to dip your toes in into some of the things that you can actually make with all the cool shells that you find all over the beach. And the reason I'm not making these projects overly difficult is because this is going to be an introduction for folks who watch my channel to check out what I'm going to be offering this winter in memberships. I have memberships uh, launch planned for uh, right before the holidays, right before Christmas this year. And part of those memberships is going to include crafting classes with me called Coastal Crafting with Mitch. So this video is a bit of an experiment. I want to see how it goes. I want to see if people actually like the format. I want you to give me a ton of feedback. I, I want you to tell me if I left anything out. Did I forget something that you really needed to know? Was the pace too fast? Was the pace too slow? Uh, all of those things because we are doing this as an experiment to see how the classes are going to go in the future. But memberships are looking to be uh, two crafting classes a month once I get that going. So today we're going to look at three different projects and then I'm just I'm going to briefly show you one that's already complete that I, I don't even need to show you how to do. It's like a, a bonus fourth project but it's so simple I, I really don't need to instruct you on it. <laughs> Essentially, it's uh, placing some shells in your jar after they're cleaned with some fairy lights. And I'll just show you what that looks like when it's together. And you can decorate the top of the jar or whatever. It's really cute, too. And it's fairly simple to accomplish. And it's a really nice memento for those trips that you took over this year to uh, put them out at the holidays and enjoy the memories from all of those fun shelling trips. So let's talk about our first three uh, projects here and the, the materials that you need. And here are our three projects. I've got them on my little table stand here in the living room. Our first project is this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous set of lights with these beautiful little shells lighting up. Let's turn that off and give you the full effect. Look how fun that is. Turkey wings, and calico clams, and scallops, egg cockles, whelks, we got little Florida fighting conks in here and here. There's another egg cockle. There's a beautiful tulip. So that's project number one. Now, kind of bend down and get a different angle. Turn the lights back on. Here's project number two, which unfortunately the lighting in here is really not doing it any justice. But it is a really adorable shadow box. And it's got that burlap in the back, the sea star, the sand dollar, and that cute little seahorse, and some sea whip and some shells. So that's really fun. And then project number three, of course, is our gorgeous little ornament. We've got different shells in there and some ribbon type uh, things in here curled up, wide tinsel, 
We got a really cute little shell and bow on the top and a ribbon hanger and some really fun little shells in there. So those are going to be our three projects for today. And here's that sweet little jar light with the fairy lights in it and the shells. Super easy. So last week I posted this on my community tab on my channel and it just lists out some of the things that you're going to need to make some of these projects. Now you'll see on there a set of battery operated fairy lights and a wide mouth uh, jar. That's for the, uh, the really easy one that I don't really have to show you very much. Um, we're going to start out with a set of Christmas lights, then we're going to do a shadow box, and then we're going to do an ornament. So for the Christmas lights, you are going to need a set of indoor-outdoor lights, preferably LED as opposed to the mini lights. The LEDs get much less hot. Now you can get as long a strand as you want, but you need shells for all the lights on it. So if you pick out a strand that's got 20 lights versus that's got 100 lights, you may have a little more or a little less work to do here. Uh, the set I'm working on in the video actually has 35 of them though, so that was a pretty good size. You're going to need a hot glue gun and or a hot glue pot if you have one. It's always nice to keep that around as well. And you can throw whatever extra little bits of glue that come off of things or whatever into your glue pot and sort of recycle them that way as well. Okay, so that's all we need for the, the first one is the set of lights, hot glue gun, and hot glue sticks. For the second project, you're going to need a small shadow box. You're going to need some scrapbook paper that will fit in the inside of your small shadow box. And an assortment of beachy goodies and shells and things like that to put in there too. Uh, you'll see when we get to uh, my version of it, I used also some uh, wide burlap ribbon as a, a background. And I had, I don't know, sea whip and sand dollar and a, a little sea star and some other cool stuff. So basically just for that shadow box, you're, you're gathering up some beach goodies that you've collected and you want to just make special and put in a box. Uh, they're going to need to be smaller shells if you're working with a smaller shadow box because the shells can only be as thick as the inside of your shadow box so that's just something to remember when you're pulling your shells out for this project and again of course you need the hot glue gun and glue sticks for that as well and then for the little ornament I have a two-piece snap together Christmas ornament. I, I want to say it's like three inches in diameter so that's your plain clear plastic tree ornament on the list um, you can also uh, look for curling ribbon, the kind of thing that you uh, decorate packages with and stuff like that to curl up and put on the insides of this. You can also include tinsel or buffalo snow, whatever you want, whatever you want to do. Now, I've also grabbed a piece of ribbon to go around the outside edge and I glue it over the, uh, the snap together portion of the ornament so that it kind of hides that little seam and line. And mine happened to be elastic so I was able to just sort of glue it in the center and stretch the ends up to the, uh, the top point and I didn't even have to measure. Easy peasy. But if you're not sure what ribbon you're going to want or use, you want something that's roughly a half an inch wide, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And it needs to be maybe a foot to 18 inches long, depending on the size of your ornament. Your ornament may be a bigger size or smaller size than mine is, so you'll need to adjust that accordingly. All right, I've already got my crafty thinking cap on, my holiday thinking cap on. Time to get some glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Now, um, I'm experimenting with chapters on this video as well. Because we do have Shell ID and we have projects going on, the, the video is a little bit longer than what my normal videos would be. So I would like you to be able to jump around as you need to and, and see the things that you want to. We're going to start out with Shell ID and jump right into cleaning and things like that with the Dremel so that you can actually see the Dremel in action and getting some of that crusty beach stuff off your shells. Then we're going to get into the identification portion and the crafting portion after that. So I'm going to try to set up chapters so that you can jump around and view what portion of the video you need whenever you feel like it.
So today I decided to jump right into cleaning before we do the ID, and I grabbed a sailor's ear that had a bunch of worm snail bits and leftovers in it. It's been sitting around for a really long time. Uh, but these are pretty, these sailor's ears are pretty fragile shells. Sometimes this will work out for you, and sometimes this won't. So you just have to, to try and see what happens. For right now, this did work out. Now I'm moving on to my second sailor's ear that you can see here and there's barnacles on the outside. It's not all stuff on the inside. And again, I have just a diamond wheel on the end of my uh, rotary tool here. And I'm just chipping away lightly at these little barnacles to pop them off, break them up, and get them off of that shell without damaging the shell if I can. Now there was a lot of yuck and stuff stuck around these oysters as you can see here. But this process actually worked very quickly and uh, it, I've gone through these shells with my pick in the past, trying to get these barnacles and things off of there. And this went a lot uh, more quickly and a lot better outcome for how well the, the shell turned out. And it's amazing to, to see just how, how fast this goes. I mean, this is just a matter of, you know, a few seconds really when you're doing it in real time. You're seeing it sped up a bit here, though. All right, so now I'm going to slow the video down so you can see this kind of in slow motion how this happens. As you work this diamond wheel across these barnacles, if they are really uh, been around for a while, they'll just pop right off of there. See that? How nice that comes off. And I'm not really even touching the shell. I'm more or less just touching the barnacles themselves to get them vibrating and to, to pop off of this little egg cockle that we see here underneath all this crusty stuff and yucky crap. So now you're seeing me work in slow motion to get this stuff off of here. Then I'm going to go ahead and just show you the video in real time. And here we are in actually regular normal real time so you can see the process. And after I got these little guys off of there I cleaned up the edge a little. Now we're going to take a swing at a couple of operculums here, and I'm showing you this in actual normal time, in real time. Not sped up, not slowed down. You can see I'm working with an extremely light touch, just getting the, the edge of that wheel into those oysters to pop them off. See how that just popped off right there? And operculums are pretty fragile, so you have to have a very light touch when you do this so that you don't go through it with the wheel just a little skim of a touch let the tool do the work don't apply pressure and of course dremel cleaning works fantastic on calicos scallops and bays look at that how nice that popped that little barnacle off super fast and here's another one a really pretty little calico that has some yellow color that i really like and it's covered with oysters and yuck so you just work in different directions you try to get the wheel into the the little radial ridges the grooves and you try to chip away a little bit at the shells uh the oyster shell that is is the edge of that where it's a little looser on the shell and it helps start breaking it up into pieces so that the wheel can get it off of there and you see i change directions a lot i move the shell around a lot i move the tool around just like small little circles and back and forth, no big aggressive movements. And I'm not putting hard pressure on any of this stuff because we want to let the tool do the work. We're not trying to press this thing through the shell and cut it. We're just trying to cause enough vibration and, and motion and slight sanding, if you will, to cause the oysters that are on the outside of this shell to break so that it can be uh, scraped off with this tool. This is so much faster than letting them sit in bleach and so much less aggravation than trying to work with a pick that this is actually my preferred method for cleaning any shell that's really sturdy. These scallops, for example, are a great, great way to start and practice this technique on. All right, next up we have a giant Atlantic cockle, getting some of the crud off of that guy, and a couple of more scallops. 
Now that black background that you see with the dust all over it, that's an apron that I'm wearing. I'm also wearing safety glasses and an N95 particulate mask as well because what you don't want is to breathe in shell dust or have any of this stuff fly and hit you in the eyes. So safety first, wear protective gear. Here we are trying to take a little bit of oysters off of a Sunray Venus clam. Now this is a sturdy shell but the pattern on the outside is very thin. It doesn't go all the way through the thickness of the shell. So be exceedingly careful on a shell like this because you can actually remove the pattern completely from the shell if you press a little too hard. And here we have a buttercup lucine with the same oystery problem on there. But that stuff's all coming off the lucine without much problem or damage to the shell or anything like that. Works pretty well. Wow. So I sort of powered through some of the cleaning there after the sorting to give you an idea that you can actually clean up a few of these shells and, and be a, a little tougher on them. Uh, this one I think should be astonishing. It was green, it was covered in barnacles, it had oysters and barnacles on both sides of it, and look at it now. I haven't even bleached it yet. So this one came out great. The one that had all the worm, snail, carcass casings in it, I tried to go through and I got a bunch of it off, but misplaced my Dremel and went right through the middle of it. So that one did not survive, but a lot of these other ones did. And uh, you could see there's just a hint a little bit of green on some of these guys. They have not actually been through the bleach yet. They will be going through bleach soon. And of course, I'm not gonna use the ones that haven't been bleached. I don't work with them when I'm crafting with things until after the fact. So let's ID some of this fun stuff. Just go around the table real quick and look at these little goodies and beauties that we got from Shell Key. I'm gonna start over here. These are gonna need a little bit of bleaching, not a ton. A couple of them have a little bit of green on them, as you can see right here. But these guys are okay. My buttercup blue scenes. Look at that nice line in that one, how beautiful. Moving around, we've got a, a yellow prickly cockle here, and a piece of a true tulip, and some sailor's ears that were just enormous. Typically, this is the size I find them. That's that's about average. These are the monsters we were finding that day. So there were some extremely big sailor's ears. I don't know if you can tell by looking at the two of these. I'm going to set them sideways. This one would be even bigger if he wasn't chipped. He's missing some that goes right around here. So there were some pretty good sailor's ears up there. We also got a couple of... Uh, these guys which i love this one's going to need bleaching but this one won't these are atlantic fat talons i just love that shell We've got a docinia up here a dystocinia up here piece of an angel wing uh fairly torn up little whelk and now that i see what crap shape he's in i'm probably gonna throw him in the flower beds talk about that guy in a second beautiful pear whelk though really pretty nice shape Another piece of a true tulip. It's actually eh, half there at least, so I'll trim that up and be able to use that on something. Got a little spiny jewel box. All oh, these really cool egg cockles. And uh, boy, it's been a recurring theme since Adalia came into town. We have been finding egg cockles left and right. Some of them are big, some of them are small. But uh, been lots and lots of them to be had. Got some jingles here. Little spiny jewel box. And a couple of the thin cyclonellas, which we normally find at Fort DeSoto. So that was kind of fun to find these above DeSoto. Calico clam. Cute little uh, kitten paws. Not hooked to their other half, but hooked to each other. So I just thought that was fun. I kind of liked that. Some southern horse mussels with that pretty purple I love. A pretty torn up apple murex. I don't think I'm going to keep that guy either. He's pretty rough. Got a bryozoan colony piece here. And some crown conch pieces here. Loads of the sunray venuses. And I mean, just look at the differences on the colors on some of them. Gosh, that's a pretty shell. And it comes in such a variety. Really, really nice. 
We've got some juvenile versions of the giant Atlanta cockles, some bay scallops, calico scallop, there's another one, and these little guys, which are rough scallops, and I really like those. And then we've just got a little crossbarred Venus I picked up because I like the interior color on it. Some operculums, you saw me uh, dremeling the junk off of those a minute ago. Got a beautiful little sand dollar here. It needs a little bit of time in the peroxide. So that's where that one will be going next. Alternate talons. We've been really hitting it good in the uh, talon department lately too. My goodness. So we got quite a few alternate talons that day. That was cool. A couple of bubbles, a couple of moon snails. Very tiny little precursor guy, a little juvenile guy for the fighting conks. So it's not even uh, not even nearly full grown there. And a cute little whelk. Hinged pair of coquinas, I love those. And this little guy, he was awesome. That is a coffee bean melampus. I don't find these very often. It was unusual that I found one at Shell Key and then another one up at Sunset Beach, two in one day from two different beaches. That was uh, pretty incredible, actually. Here's that crazy frond oyster that we found with these little spines on it and that really wild color with the gold tan interior and the kind of purple on the outside. I thought that was a really, really neat shell. Yeah, really tiny little prickly cockle, too. And I just loved the color in the interior. Look at the speckles up in there. That's amazing. Some nice worm snails, a cute olive, and a lucky limpet. You guys know I love my lucky limpets. And a little teeny tiny sand dollar as well. And its, it's color is actually nice, so I'm not going to put this one in the peroxide. I think he's going to be fine just the way he is piece of a big moon snail and some baby's ears now most of the time we find baby's ears they're between this and this size some small ones this guy is huge he's a beast that's actually very good size for a baby's ear so we're pretty excited about that one and we had some jingles in there too so all in all lots of fun little goodies from shell key you guys have seen me pick these up a number of times. These are the southern horse muscle with that really pretty purple. That's these guys right here. And they're a fairly common find for our, our whole area. These guys, the little tiny scorched muscles, the American muscle. So I do like this one, but we found something completely different. He's huge like double the size of the horse muscles, which by the way, those are good size for horse muscles right there. So what's the story with this guy? Because his outside doesn't look the same either. So I had to go into my book and look a little bit for that one and I believe I found him right here. A ribbed muscle, max five inches long. And believe it or not, usually not found anywhere near me. This is like what I would call a Jacksonville shell. I have no idea how this got into the Gulf and made it over to Shell Key. It isn't the kind of thing that you would necessarily buy at a craft store. All right, so I don't think this is a wedding shell. This is an out of place shell and this wouldn't be something that you would uh, find at a craft store to make a wedding shell out of. I don't really know what to think here. Either this muscle is more common on the Gulf than what this would tell us. Or, it, I don't know, it got picked up in a, got picked up by a Taurus and dropped the, I, I honestly, I can't come up with a way that this made it from over by Jacksonville. As you can see, that's where we find this. I have no idea how this could have gotten to there. But as you see, there's Tampa Bay right there. So I'm not sure how this little guy made it completely across the state, but I'm actually excited that it did because otherwise I normally wouldn't find one of these. And that nacre on the inside with that white opalescent is absolutely beautiful. So what we have here is, I'd call it an out of place shell.
another strange shell is this guy. Those weird spikes on it. And this one is called a frond oyster. Now, frond oysters are not super common, as you can see by the double line instead of a solid line over here. So frond oysters are mostly found further south of us, honestly. So to find this little guy over there at Shell Key was also kind of cool. Not so out of place as this fella, but still not a very common find. I don't see these very often. Once in a while you'll see a piece of a sea whip blown in on the beach and it might have one or two of these on them. But this is not something I find littered all over our beaches at all. So that was kind of nice to find a frond oyster. Wow, this is an oh my goodness haul pile from when we went to Sunset Beach on Eclipse Day after we got done at Shell Key seeing all the dolphins and the pelicans and finding shells out there. We went over to Sunset Beach and my goodness did we ever score. Look at this pile of stuff. All right, let's start talking about it. I'll start off up here with some of our small Florida fighting conks. And I do believe we have a dove snail or two in here. I've got to take a closer look at the book, but this to me does not look like a normal Florida fighting conch like these guys do. These to me look like they're dove snails. We do have some spectacular fighting conks in there. Look at the colors on that guy. Actually, believe it or not, he's not the plaid one, but he looks very similar to the plaid one I have. We have an enormous pile of prickly cockles, and some of them have absolutely stunning colors in them. Now, I'm not really used to seeing a lot of sh yellow on prickly cockles. Most of the time when we find them, they're just, you know, the peach and the purple and the white with some brown on the outside. Lately, however, I have been finding a number of them with yellow on them, and I'm a little confused by that because uh, I really never noticed it before this year. All right, so here's one without it. There's what the outside of his shell looks like. He just looks like a regular old prickly cockle, right? Like he's peach, he's purple. All right, but then we get these guys that have that bold yellow along the side. See that yellow there along the side? And a hint of yellow on the outside of the shell. Let's take a look at that again. All right, this one's regular. He doesn't have any yellow or gold on him. He's uh, got... A, a little bit of tan on the outside of the shell, mostly white and brown, okay? But then look at this one and this one. Look at how much yellow is on the outside of these shells, just like this guy here. This one doesn't really have that, but these guys do. Now, when I flip them over and you see the insides of them, look at this. That one is almost like an orange, and we've got like a mustard yellow going on in here. So apparently there is a, a type of this cockle, and it, it doesn't match the shape of a yellow cockle because it's not round enough, right? But it also doesn't match the shape of our other prickly cockles that have the long straight edges. So I'm a, every time I find one of these, I'm like, is it a cross between a yellow and a prickly? Did something weird happen in nature with this? 
Or maybe is this just more of a recessive trait and I just happen to be finding them because a bunch of them blew in after the stone age. Either way, um, kind of a, an interesting find and a very interesting difference with the colors. And we do have some more of the yellows over here, including this great hinged one. I got a couple of the small beach tacos that were hinged. I thought those were cute. Oh, my heartbreaker, the alphabet comb that was not. Some beautiful buttercup lucines and a thick lucine. Actually, this guy here is a thick lucine. Looks a little different on the outside, definitely different on the inside. We got a nice collection of egg cockles here, a couple of different styles. We've got some of these little purple mussels. And I've got the American horse mussel, the southern horse mussel are very well represented in here. And we have one hinged pair of scorched mussels. That's this little guy. Really skinny, super shiny on the inside, and a lot of actual uh, texture right here on the outside of the shell. So that's how you can tell the scorched mussels. They're, they tend to be quite a bit smaller than the other ones. I kept this little jingle out because you can see the baby's foot on that so well, and I just loved it. There's purple tageless, of our uh, sand dollars, tulip pieces. We got a couple of pieces of lips off of the fighting conks. Some pieces of horse conch and an actual little baby horse conch. One of the last things I found out there, actually. Hmm. I'm noticing I don't see my piece of Genonia on the table. I must have dropped it somewhere, but I did find a piece of a J out there that day, too. It was the last thing I picked up. I'll have to take a little closer look for it. Here we have an operculum from a tulip. The white Atlantic semile and the white crested talons. And I also cannot find my white crested talon from Shell Key that day because I should have a third one here. But it apparently fell out of my bag somewhere along the way. So I'll take a look around the house and see if I've still got it. But I may have lost it. And here we got a couple of uh, other little finds. A button. This guy here who's so surf worn, I'm not really sure, but I think he's a dove snail too. Some moon snails. Some chestnut turbans. Got couple of real cute little urchins here. Our uh, lucky limpet with the big hole in the top. A gorgeous coquina in orange and pink. Love that. More baby's ears, which we've been finding a lot of baby's ears since the storm, which is so cool. Well, we'll talk about these two guys in a second here. I'm going to move them out of the way. There's the brittle star and the little tiny cone, which I think is a Stearns cone. I got to look him up too. Our coffee bean lamp is here. Some cone bitter sweets. There's that fossil nutmeg John found when we first got here. We also have a, a fossil bubble. And you can tell, look at the difference in the size on that. So much bigger than the others. Another little button here. Another cone here. Really discolored moon snail that I found fascinating. There's a little bit of horse conch that John found there. The top part of it. There's one of our uh, tube worm or bryozoan pieces. Some alternate talons. Rather large one, actually. Got the carapace pieces from the calico box crabs here. Olives. Some really, really pretty crossbarred Venus with some unusual coloring. Most of the time they're like this. Purple and the yellow. But we got some that were pretty much straight yellow. And I thought those were pretty neat, too. Let me move it back here. We've got some great apple murex shells. Some mossy arcs, calico clams, turkey wings. We have three hinged pairs of docinia, one pair of elegant and two pairs of disc. Pretty cool. A collection of crap that we picked up off the beach. And um, I, I may not show you everything we pick up and I may not show you us picking it up. But if we see trash in front of us, we pick it up just so that, you know, you guys know that. Look at that piece of glass that we found though. That is gorgeous. I love that color. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it yet, but something, because it's just so pretty. Here's our collection of fossils that we got there. And honestly, I think this olive is a fossil too, because he matches this one in the front. And you see how the spires on them are quite different than what we have today here in the lettered olive. So these are a, a different 
subspecies in the olive family, I'm pretty sure. Look at the pile of worm snails. Gosh, we've been finding lots of those too. Here we have some nice lightning whelks, some pieces, some really great pieces, and then some cute small ones too. Some pear whelks here in the front. Here's a collection of coral and bryozoans, which was awesome. So yeah, we found some really, really nifty, nifty stuff out there. There's my serifs and augers. And lots and lots of scallops. Can you tell though, we have a couple of different kinds. We have the regular calico scallop and then we've got the bay scallops. These guys get a lot bigger and their colors aren't nearly as stunning. I think this one was maybe one of the prettiest of the day, but that guy's pretty gorgeous too. We have a beautiful yellow one back here that looked very pale and faded when I picked it up, but now that it's been cleaned up, it looks great. And look at that orange. Oh, man, that's lovely. Okay, one of these little guys that we picked up at Sunset Beach had all kinds of barnacles on them. And most of the time, this is a hard thing to pick off with a, uh, a pick without damaging the sand dollar. So we're gonna give it a shot with the Dremel and see how it goes. But I've already taken a couple off that way. If you are very careful and do not push hard and go, you know, take your time, don't rush it, you should be able to get these little guys off of here. Let's give it a whirl. That sucks. I did such a great job getting all those barnacles off there. I got right to the end and there was a crack in this thing and it split it. However, we did just prove that you can take barnacles off a sand dollar with a Dremel if your sand dollar isn't cracked and you go slow. Now, since I did break my little uh, guy, although I, I really don't want to blame it on the Dremel. I mean, the the Dremel was doing great. It wasn't taking anything off, but the whole thing just cracked across the middle. There may have been a crack already there, or the vibration from the machine may have uh, hurt it. Now, here's what the inside of one of these guys looks like. You can see there's quite a big cavity in there. Now, right here, these are the little mouth parts that came out of there. These are their little, the little teeth. For a sand dollar, this is how they eat. Similar to a, uh, a sea urchin. Let me grab one of those. Now here's one of the sea urchins that we picked up that day that was all dried out and not good anyway. But let me go ahead and, and see if I can get the Aristotle's lantern out. Sometimes they come out and sometimes it takes a lot of work. But what I'm trying to show you is that this little five-part mouthpiece, it's bigger in an urchin, but it's almost the exact same thing. See, the urchin is thicker, right? So his teeth can be deeper and thicker. But as you can see, they go to a little five-point star. I just took some of that little dead membrane off of there. Well, that's what these things do. They line up inside... And there's five of them. So one of them didn't come out of our sand dollar. He may have fallen out earlier, or it may have just gone flying when this thing broke, or maybe it's trapped in here someplace and I just can't see it. But there's normally five of those little guys inside of a, uh, a sand dollar. Now what these actually are, are a form of urchin. A five hole, keyhole sand dollar is actually a sea urchin of sorts related to this little guy. I don't 
know if you remember me picking this one up. He was full of barnacles inside. I picked him up because he was so dark. So, I got all that crusty stuff out there. I put the first pass of the Dremel and clean that up. Look at how dark the inside of that giant Atlantic cockle is. Very, very nice. It could stand with a little more cleaning, but just to, to get it cleaned up quick. Because if you remember, it was literally covered in barnacles and it looked terrible. But a little work with the Dremel brought it right back to being cute again. Very nice. I also wanted to show the difference in the, the worm snails. We get two basic styles of worm snail here. Something that curls rather regularly. These are the West Indian worm snail guys right here. And then these are the Florida worm snails. And they do not make that regular nice coil. They get all goofy and wonky like this. So there are actually a couple of different kinds of worm snails out there on the beach. And you can sort of tell what it's from just by looking at the edges of it a little bit. I'm going to pull these two pieces over here. See how this has more of a, a regular, not only just more of a regular coil and shape, but the outside is a little smoother. It's kind of like some lines that run along the edge of it right through there. And you can see that on this one. So you know that this one came from the same style as this. Now these Florida ones have a much different texture. See how lumpy and bumpy and irregular that is? It doesn't have those lines that go lengthwise down like these guys do. So you can tell when you pick it up even without the coil. If it's got a, a strange thinner body that's very irregular with no lines running through it, it's most likely that Florida worm snail. Whereas these guys with these nice long lines that you can see running around the body would be this one from the West Indian. Remember this little hinge pair we picked up and it was all pinkish brown and discolored and kind of gross. We thought surf clams. We didn't really think much of it. Well, once this little guy got cleaned up and I could see how it came together and what the shape of it actually was down here, I believe what we have here is another small hinged pair of fragile matra clams, which is awesome because they're a fairly rare find for us. Uh, we found a few right after the storm at sunset, and then we found this little uh, cute set over there as well. How fun! Well, we've had a look at all the fabulous shells that we found out at Shell Key and Sunset Beach. So let's change gears away from our identification and cleaning into some crafting fun. All right, we are at my craft bench. We're going to take a look at doing something fun with miniature lights. Now, as you see here, I've got a small set that are the, the clear. I've got a set of micro LEDs and I have a set of mini LEDs and this set is indoor outdoor so if you wanted to put these up outside you could if you wanted to when we're done but I'm not uh, sure that I need quite this long of a run of them Now these here will run on batteries and then these here uh, I think they plug in. So we're going to try these out. And what we're going to do is attach some shells to them and make ourselves some shell Christmas lights. So here's what our strand of lights looks like. Lit it up. And it's got the white wire, which I kind of like for this project because it doesn't seem Christmassy this way and you can kind of use them all year round. But it's just a small little strand of lights. As a matter of fact, here's where the end is. And I've got them plugged in down here off camera. And these are the minis. Now these aren't mini LEDs, but the mini LEDs would even be better because these tend to get a little tiny bit warm. I mean, not hot, they're Christmas lights, right? But, but they do get a little warm. And since we're gonna be gluing something to them, I don't necessarily want anything that'll possibly melt any glue. So I'm gonna work with these and attaching things above where the warmth of the light is going to be. Alright, before I can actually move ahead, I need to know how many lights I have. And I believe the box said 35. Well, let's just count real quick. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 35 lights. Okay. So in order to make this strand of shells, I'm going to need 35 shells. And I'm going to want some 
that are roughly about this big so that I have a place to attach it without attaching the light bulb itself to the shell. And I want something that uh, the light will transmit through. So let's say there's a buttercup lucene. And with that attached, look how pretty that'll be. Here is an olive. Barely anything. Barely shows anything. So you're going to want shells that are translucent and will allow light to go through. Scallops will work. And here, let me just turn the lights off on two of these. You can sort of see the, the glow that's happening behind the shells. See that? So clearly the lighter color shows up better than the, the pattern does. I think these Wilkes will also work too. Yeah, see those glow kind of nicely. That's pretty too. So you just want an assortment of shells. All of them, you know, roughly a, a certain size so that you can attach them to the lights and that they're big enough to, to show up when you put them on your tree or put them on your curtains or wherever you're putting them. All right, you can choose which end you want to start from. Uh, it just so happens that this end is the end that's plugged in. So I'm going to start from here so I can move the lights down and out of my way as I go along. I'm going to start off with one of these nice scallops. And I'm just going to sort of see where it looks good in that little configuration. And you'll notice I have the light kind of near the shell, but there's some, you know, air space around it. And what I'm going to do is take my hot glue and I'm going to attach this wire to the shell. And then I'm going to hold on to it until it's cooled so that it doesn't move around. And this takes a little bit of glue. There we go. Now we're starting to sort of set. So I'm just going to leave my set of lights plugged in. And I'm going to work my way down my strand of lights. Each different shell will attach a little bit differently, so you'll have to kind of fit it by hand. Also, as you work, you want to try to untwist the, the light strand a little bit and make sure that you're gluing everything to the same side so that what you see is that and not that. And it's already starting to set up and cool, you can see. Oh, I got my finger in there, didn't want to do that. And you just want to keep this still until the glue sets. Alright, that's getting cool enough to where I can set it aside now. And see what I mean? Like everything is, is twisted. Some of them want to point up, some of them want to point down. So you'll have to do the best you can with trying to keep them in line as you straighten them out. And when you go to arrange them on wherever you're going to hang them or put them. If you're going on the tree, you can kind of make it, you know, it won't be as, it won't fight you as much as it will if you're putting them, say, on a table display, for example. All right, so this one wants to lay this way. So we'll go ahead, get the next shell in place. Now I've got tulips here. So the tulip will light up nicely with that light inside. So I want to make sure that my shell is going to face the same way and that this is mounted inside so that this lights up too. Hold it in place and flip it over. And this time I'm going to be attaching this here so that it'll light that shell up. And this is not a, a quick procedure. This is a little bit of a time-consuming process, but it's going to look really great when it's done. Oh my gosh. Just got to keep this in place until the glue cools and sets.
Okay, that's about cooled down now. Move on to the next one. And we're going to continue this way with an assortment of different shells that I pulled. Grabbed a couple of egg cockles, a couple of tulips. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but the uh, calico clams also glow kind of nicely, as do the juvenile fighting conchs, because their shells are still very thin. When they get thicker, the white won't transmit at all with them. So, But this size, and it's nice and thin, so this transmits light beautifully. Actually quite gorgeous. What else do we have over here? Got a couple of lightning whelks to do this with as well. Scallops and docinias. Because those glow nicely too. So I'm going to continue. Oh yeah, let me see. Got a couple of scenes, grab a few of those. I'm going to go ahead and continue working my way down the strand. Now, you can see that I'm putting one of these on every light bulb, so it's they're close together and it looks really full. But if you don't have that many shells or you don't like that look, you can totally skip every other light and just put them on just the odds or the evens, however you want to do it. There's really no wrong way, it's just a matter of personal preference and what you like. Don't worry also if there's a little extra glue on things. If it concerns you later, after it's cooled, you can trim it with an X-Acto blade. But since the glue is on the back of the shells mostly, it's not really going to show anyway. And besides, people are going to be looking at those beautiful glowing shells. Not whether or not you get extra glue on your project. So don't worry if it's not 100% neat and tidy on this one. That is okay. while this is cooling and still malleable so I can pull the excess off that way if I want to and this is why it's nice to have a glue pot handy because if you if you're not familiar with it this is a glue pot is basically for hot glue it's a little warming pot it's about this big around about that deep you can get bigger ones too but what it does is it takes little pellets or little cut up pieces of your glue sticks and melts them in a pot so you can just take things and dip them. And floral arrangers and folks like that use them all the time. I actually use one when I'm making shell trees just because it's easier than trying to manipulate the hot glue gun all the time. All right, that's pretty well cool to the touch. And our light strand is starting to come together and look really nice. So I, you'll see I've got this little work area right here that I left exposed and then I've got the, the shells and the lights sitting over here so that you can see that stuff better. And I'm just going to go ahead and fast forward through a few more of these, get some more progress done, and we'll look at it how it looks on this blue background. You notice how I glued this one in for the fighting conch a little differently so it would light up the fighting conch shell. and the the little light fixture here, the little bulb holder, sort of has like a rectangular shape, so it sat in there kind of nicely, actually. That worked well. Make progress. Here we have our lights all finished 
and plugged in for our holiday tablescape to go with our holiday decorating. Look how great this makes the shelves glow. And we got most of them right where they needed to be. The wire I want us to twist a little bit with this one. That's not a super huge deal because everything else is laying great. There we have it coming through a calico clam and some Florida fighting Kongs, a bay scallop, an egg cockle, a tulip, buttercup lucine, and the turkey wing. So yeah, there's a lot of shelves that you can use on these little light sets to make this work out. You just have to pick a shell that will allow the light to sort of transmit through it. So older fighting conks that are more thick didn't really work. Um, the bigger docinias are very thick. The bigger clams are really thick. But, you know, avoid the really thick ones. Get the thinner ones. And the light looks just beautiful coming through them. Right. let's get on to the next project. So you'll see I have a little selection of nice shells, and things that I like the color of and the shape of. And you'll also notice they're not too terribly thick because I want them to fit inside of this shadow box. Now this is just a standard little four by six shadow box you can get at the hobby store, the craft store or whatever. And I've already taken the liberty to speed things up a little bit of going ahead and mounting some scrapbook paper on the, the back piece of this to give us a background on which to mount our shells. So one of the tests we do before we put anything on anything, we need to make sure that the shells we picked all fit. So the way we test that is when you uh, put something in the back of this, see this ridge right here, right around. This ridge is what this backing piece sits on. And those little holes are what the little locking tabs lock into. So basically your shells can't be any thicker than the distance from the glass to the very edge of this where the backing rests. So you take and drop your shells in here and you take a look. Now, if you look at this properly, you'll notice and let me put the black under here just so you can see this a little bit. You'll notice that our whelk sits up above this little ridge and our urchin sits below it. So the urchin can go safely in there, but this whelk is too big. So if I wanna use whelk, oops, I have to find a slightly smaller whelk, like this one. And I had picked this one because I like the color of it, but it's actually taller than I thought too. So what I have to find is a whelk that fits under that ledge. And there we go. That pair of whelk will fit beautifully. That's actually just right. So we don't keep the big shells for this one because this shadow box isn't as deep. Now, of course, you can get bigger shadow boxes. You can get deeper shadow boxes that'll allow you to get some really big chunky stuff in there. But since this is just one of the smaller ones, this one being just four by six, I think it's four by six anyway, let me measure that real quick. Since this is a smaller one, we have to use, you know, smaller shells. All right, so to the outside edge, it's eight, but to the inside, oh, look at that, it's just under seven. It's actually a five by seven frame, sorry. All right, so it's six by eight on the outside but the inside area is five by seven on this guy. All right, so what you wanna do before you finalize and close anything also is wipe this out with a paper towel and Windex so you don't have any dust or any sand from your shells or anything like that in there with them. It's also a really good idea if you have shells like this and like augers that you go ahead and tap them. See if any more bits of sand come out, no matter how well you clean your shells. It seems like there's always a little something stuck in them. All right, well, these here have been uh, cleaned pretty well and sitting for a while. So, fortunately, everything's already out of those. 
Seriously, I pick up tulips and sand dollars and find sand in them all the time. Yep, this one's cleaned out well, too. All right, so now we know there's no sand in here that's going to fall to the bottom of our project and get stuck down in there either. Now, the next thing to decide is if your frame has this, then you can orient your layout vertically or horizontally because you can hang it from either direction. Some of your frames are only going to hang this way, though. So just keep an eye on that and make sure before you start laying your composition out that you know which way your frame goes so you know which way your uh, composition will fit in your frame well, i've just got a little bit of alcohol on here i'm gonna just clean this off really quickly usually when you bring them home from the craft store they've got kind of like a warehouse dust or something like that on them so it's always a good idea to go around and wipe them out wipe the front wipe the inside There we go. Now I put this down for my background and I'm really not all that um, in love with the texture of this. I like the color though because it's nice and it's neutral and it's, it's got a little interest. So I cut a piece of this really wide, I think this is a six inch wide uh, burlap ribbon. Yes. And that's just available at the, the craft store as well. So I've, I've gone ahead with this craft store ribbon and I've just cut off a piece that's a little bigger than what I need. And I'm going to, you can see there's like a little bit of a wave to it. So you can actually get some kind of fun effects, you know, just playing with the fabric if you want. But I want it to be fairly straight and fairly burlap looking. And because there's big holes in it, see the, the hint of my paper kind of shows through there, but it doesn't all the way show. And that's kind of cool, I sort of like that. So, you take the hot glue. I'm going to put a good bit of this down to hold this on the edges and in the center because we're going to be attaching stuff to this burlap. And lay it right in there. There we go. Pat it into place. It's a little warm because of the glue. The glue's going to come through a little bit. Don't even worry about that because we are going to be going over it. Now, as you can see, there is an overlap, and that will get in the way if we try to put this frame back together. So we're going to go ahead and take off the extra with just scissors. Very simple. Okay. So now here's our background with our burlap on it. I'm just going to throw these pieces away. I don't need them for anything else. I'm going to double check and make sure that this still fits on there. Yep, so I can close it. Great. And now I have to decide what do I want my composition to be. You can make this holiday themed if you want to, or you can just go coastal decor theme if you'd rather. I mean, I could take different size sand dollars and just make a snowman out of them. That would totally work. Or I could do it with scallops, or I could do it with anything. But I, I'm not necessarily wanting it to be a... I don't want this to just be a holiday decoration, even though it's going to be for a gift. I'm going to make this something that you can theme in your home all year round. So I'm going to make a composition out of these shells. I'm going to layer a few things in a few different ways and places. See how things look. Try to get it sort of random looking. All right, we needed some vertical elements here. So I grabbed some pieces of Sea Whip. That's what these guys are. These are little pieces of sea whips. And they're super fun. You do all kinds of cool things with these little guys making shadow boxes. They're really cool. So we're going to put those in our background. And we're going to put a sand dollar here. 
and a little star. And I think to tie in with this purple, I'll use a scallop here. And then, boy, you know I got something special I want to use on this. I'll be right back. All right, I've been fooling around having some fun with this. And this is what I stopped to pick out. Isn't that darling? It's a cute little baby seahorse. I got this guy at the Shell Show in Sarasota last winter. And I've been saving him for something really cool. And I think it might just be this shadow box. Now he's getting a little lost back here on the burlap. So I do think I'm going to mount it here on the sand dollar and I might even like make it look like his little tail is hooked into this hole right here oh my gosh that is precious okay that's the composition that I want that's exactly what I want to do so now comes the fun part now you remember what it is that your composition looked like and you take things off and you start gluing them onto the background for me when I have something like this done up, I like to take a picture with my cell phone and then I have exactly in, my, in front of me while I'm working on it so that my composition came out the way that I laid it out. All right, so I'm gonna take a picture of this guy with my phone, nice and centered. There we go. And now, I've got the photo of my composition and I can set it right in front of me and work from it like that so that I can see it while I'm laying things out because I'm going to have to take these things off to move them. You have to glue things that are going to be on the bottom first and things that are going to be on the top like this guy last. So gently take your composition apart. There we go. And now I'm looking at my photo on my phone so I could see my composition and recreate it back in front of me. Better add another glue stick in. Gonna need a little bit. Now with the glue stick on these shadow boxes, you don't have to be too terribly heavy handed. Unlike the lights, um, where the glue was kind of in the back, this is a little more front and center. So we want to keep the, the glue lines a little neater than we did for the, the show lights. Just a very light touch. And I'm not sponsored by anybody. Um, so I can say without any uh, hesitation, I use these glue sticks that I use and this glue gun that I use because I like them. I think they're nice and strong. They hold really well. I have good luck with them. So I'll just let you know, I use the Gorilla, the Gorilla glue gun and the Gorilla glue sticks. I think they're great. Now, Gorilla makes great stuff. And just skimming that little guy along there, just a little bit of glue. Because, I mean, it's not like these sea whips are heavy. You don't have to use a lot to hold them down. Alrighty. There goes piece number three, getting stuck there on our background. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna make this come out here, that there, my sand dollar here, this here. Yeah, see, I, I ended up moving this piece a little bit, and that's okay. It's fine if it moves a little. That one's gonna go there. And then those little guys are go there. So, I guess the next thing I'm gonna put in place will be my star because nothing else is around it and it'll just be easy to place this right now. Then I'll go with the sand dollar in this one and then work my way up.
And that little twisty flip thing I do is to make sure we don't have a bunch of glue strings everywhere. Hot glue has a tendency to do that. And I'm just avoiding the holes in it. And there we go. That's going to go like that. And see, I'm going to use the uh, the scallop to cover the ends of these sea whip pieces because they want to curl up a little bit. And that'll sort of keep them in there and keep them kind of hidden. Now, when you're doing a shell like this, it doesn't matter if you're perfect with the glue. Just get it close to the edges. When you set it down, the glue is going to do this. So it'll be stuck to the shell and stuck to your background too. You don't have to fill the whole shell or anything like that, but I usually put some close to the edges, just like this. And then as it sits, the glue runs down from gravity, and then you have glue right exactly where you want and need it. And I just hold them in, in place with my finger for a few seconds just to let the glue kind of cool and set. And then once you do that, once it's cool, it's not going to move. I'm not sure I love that olive. Thinking I might change that for an auger. I actually kind of like that better. See, and then that'll look really a lot cuter. Like that. Oh, good. Okay. And, you know, be flexible. You may have put things down there one way and liked it. Maybe you'll arrange it slightly differently and like it just as much or more. The point of this is to actually take some of the special things that you found on some of your shelling runs and trips and be able to put them in a cute little box that you can hang on the wall. There we go. All right, so now I've got the shells just where I want them pretty much. Almost the same as my picture, fairly close. And now we can put our little seahorse guy here. And yeah, that look, little doll looks just so cute. All right, do I want him that way or do I want him this way? Well, he kind of sits better this way. So that's how it's going to go. Just put a little bit of hot glue on this guy here. And then go right there. How darling. Oh my god, that's so cute. Now, one last little touch. So if you can tell on our little seahorse here, but he has an impression, like a little dip where his eye should go. And I think a rhinestone there will be perfect. So I'm going to try to find a little clear rhinestone to put there. All right, time for a great pro tip. Rhinestones from the craft store come in a little small bag and they're crazy expensive. But rhinestones that you get online for doing nail art also come in these fabulous little containers and a fraction of the price. So for something teeny tiny like our little seahorse, take a look for a nail art kit. Now it came with a bunch of other things that I'm not going to use on nails, but I might just put in resin or something like that at a later date. Little hearts and stars and... You know, little spangly, glittery things and stuff like that. But yeah, you got these really cute, tiny little rhinestones that are going to make a perfect little eye for our little guy over here. And it just so happens I have this purplish fuchsia color right there. 
and it goes great with this shell and with the sea whip so that's what i'm going to use now admittedly tiny rhinestones are not the easiest thing to pick up i have a pair of tweezers that are sort of meant for picking these little guys up and you can try that or you can try like a little wax pencil or crystal katana all right so that's where that will go that's gonna look really great so I'm gonna keep, oh no, I squeezed the tweezers and it popped out. <gasps> Guess we're doing that again. Now you can use a bunch of different things, but I kind of find that um, you want something with a little more control than the glue gun has. All right, so this is a tacky glue here. Oops, how finds my tip. Yeah, nice and, nice and fine. Because you don't want a big amount of glue. Just a little dot of glue. It's not like we're gluing an enormous rhinestone or anything like that. All right, now, since the glue is wet and I can't play around, pick this guy up with the katana instead. What that is is a little wax tip that lets you pick up rhinestones very easily. And there we go. Got our rhinestone in the glue. And then I think I'm going to attempt to take a little bit of the excess glue off of there with a small brush. And there we go. Just picking up the excess glue and pulling it right on out of there. Because just that tiny dot was way more than enough. And that glue is going to dry clear. So I'm going to spread a little bit over the top of the rhinestone as well. And look how cute. Ah, so adorable. So we're gonna give that a chance to dry and then we'll go ahead and put it in the frame. Time to get this guy in a frame. I tend to sort of just tilt this back and get the bottom end first and then press. Close up our tabs. There, that's nice and locked in now. Definitely not moving now. And there we have it. An adorable little seaside coastal bit of fun. Cute little shadow box. It's a perfect memento for any trips or vacations that you went on over this course of this year. For some great holiday gift giving or decor around your house. Super sweet. All right, now for some really simple fun. All right, this is one of those snap together Christmas ornaments that you can find at the craft store. Let's go ahead and cut this tag off of that. And I've got some, uh, you know, birthday package ribbon or, you know, Christmas wrapping ribbon, whatever. It's just in a hologram silver. And then I have this hologram clear. And this hologram clear is like a, like a big tinsel. So I'm going to grab a couple of pieces of this out and do some of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be curling these up and throwing them inside of here with a couple of cute small shells and some little pieces of mermaid money or tears, the little Shiva eyes. These are the operculums from Honeymoon Island that go to the chestnut turban. So I'm going to put something that makes a little noise in here. Something that catches a little sparkle and a little color. I also have that, um, that shaker snow. And I can't find it right now, but if I can find it, I'm going to put that in here too. Alright, first things first. These things are taped together. So what we have to do is find that tape and remove it from the outside edge. So I just sort of ran my finger until I found it. There it is. It's like a little seal that kind of goes around that thing to keep it from falling apart in the store. 
Alrighty. So that's how this little guy is goes to, up together and apart. And you know you get it in the right spot when both sides for the hook line up. Now, after we get done putting things in here, I'm gonna cover that over with ribbon to dress it up and make it look nicer. Alrighty. So first things first. I wanna pick out, let's say, two really cool shells, maybe three if they're small, and then a handful of these little Shiva eyes. So I'm gonna go ahead and put those in first because when this stands up, they'll end up on the bottom of the ornament. Now, I also mentioned I had some ribbon that's, uh, you can get this stuff. This is like a, oh, one of those banners you hang on the wall for a, says congratulations or happy birthday or whatever on it. This one happened to have this pretty green shimmery stuff and it reminded me of really wide tinsel. Sort of like this ribbon reminded me of that. So what I'm going to do is I've got six pieces or so of this. I'm going to curl this just like I curl package ribbon. And if you've never seen how I do that before, you basically grab one end, go across the back of your scissors or the blade if you're feeling really brave, and pull. And what that does is curl it. Now, for those of you that are old school and remember your grandma's doing this, I will caution you, this is very tricky with very sharp scissors. Hear that? That's the noise you want to hear to get a ringlet. And that is a little ribbon ringlet right there. So the part that's straight, I'll just snip that off. I'm gonna throw that little ribbon ringlet in there. I'm gonna repeat that for these other pieces too. Ooh, this ribbon doesn't curl. It curls the wrong way. Instead of curling end to end, it curls side to side. Hmm. Well then, I guess I won't be curling those pieces. I guess I'm just going to stick them inside. And since they're not curled, they're gonna be trickier to fit in there. So I'm only gonna put a couple of them, like three. And don't worry if they're not sitting there perfectly because we haven't even added shells yet. Now for shells, I have this really nice little whelk I wanted to put in. And what else? I have this great little apple murex to go. And, hmm. How about a fighting conch? Got a little fighting conch over here in my pile. Let's put that guy in here too. Well, this one's got some beachy stuff on him. Ooh, that's a little olive doesn't though, that's cute. Okay, olive it is. So I've got a couple of those clear pieces. And I've got another one of these little curly cues to make yet. And again. I work left to right. I hold just on to just enough of it. And there you go. I'll throw that in there too. Then I'm going to carefully put the top back on the ornament and line them up. Let's talk about finishing this little ornament off. It looks like it could use a little bit more pizzazz in there, maybe. In, but if I put too many shells in it, it's going to get really heavy. So if I put any more shells in it, it's going to have to be something that's rather big and rather lightweight. In this case, maybe this thick lucine's the right answer. Or this guy. This is actually a that's pretty big for there. So I'm gonna put that in here like this. And put that like that. And now let's try it again. Oops, see I caught the edge of that in there. Don't want the edges caught. All right, so we are snapped back together. Oh yeah, that's much cuter. That's really fun. 
So to finish this off, I'm going to go around the outside edge of this with some ribbon just to trim it. And let me see, will this piece fit all the way around, I wonder? Well, it has a little bit of elastic give to it, so it will. All right, cool. Now, when I glue this style together, if I'm doing something that's got a little stretch to it, I'm going to want to put the middle down first, then bring the ribbon up. Here we go. Set that little line on the, the middle of the ribbon. And I'm going to put a little dot here and one here. And I'm going to pull this up to the edge. And it just so happened that this piece of ribbon was actually a great size for this, but any other ribbon, if it doesn't have stretch, you'll just start from one end and then glue it around the seam to the other end. And I'll do that in another example here in a second. There, this cute, cute little ribbon edge on our ornament. All right, glue's had a chance to dry now. For the last little part of this, I'm putting some pretty ribbon on here to hang the ornament with. And then I got two little shells that I'm gonna put here and here to kind of cover that seam up, and then there'll be a little bow. So I got the ribbon through here. Go ahead and tie it in a knot to make our hanger. There we go. And then let's see. I'm going to put a little shell right there and one right there. And you see I'm just kind of putting the, the glue around the edge, but sort of on the inside on this part. That's again so that the, the glue can sort of slump down and cover things nicely. And just looking at the top, making sure I've got these guys lined up. And then for our last little touch, I have this sweet little burlap ribbon. And that's going to go right here. It's kind of holding that where I want it to go. All right. It's got a little bit of glue on the edge of there, so I'll just scrape that off. There we go. Adorable little ornament. Super, super cute. And super fast and easy. And another great way to use up some of your cool vacation memory shelves for something special for your tree or for someone else's. Sometimes ornaments don't look like a whole lot in the daylight, 
but then you get them on the Christmas tree and it's really something different. And it's a little tough to tell in the lower light, but gosh, the way the light comes through this and the shelves is really very, very pretty. Hopefully I can lighten this up a little bit when I edit it and you'll be able to see that. That is so cool. Nice. So cute on the tree. Adorable. And here is project number four, which I don't really have to show you, really. It is a wide mouth jar. We've got some clear gems, the little, uh, oh, you know, you put them in flower jars or those little glass things are about so big. That's all in the bottom. And then the fairy lights are wound around in there with shells stuffed in there. And you can see it makes the shells glow. And I just decorated the top with some raffia and it looks really cute. Now the one thing about this project that I, I didn't really think through well when I did it was the top of the jar is not really big enough for me to fit the battery pack inside. So it sits on the top like that, which I don't love. So right now I just leave it out so that it sets on the table. But for folks that want to give this a try, when you buy your fairy lights, they're going to come with a battery pack on them. Whatever jar that you're using, you just need to make sure that battery pack is going to fit on the inside of it. So you'll need something like, you know, an apothecary jar or something similar with a nice wide lid. Oh my gosh, how fun was this? <sighs> Nothing makes me happier than sitting outside cutting shells and cleaning shells or being inside and assembling shells into really neat projects. So I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope the style of this video worked where you were able to, you know, pause and then watch so that you could kind of craft along at your own pace and speed because everyone works at different speeds. And I really hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend and you're looking forward to more shelling, more crafting, and more cool new destinations. By the way, if you don't want to make any of these things, but you like what we've got going on here and you like this coastal decorative vibe, by all means, come and see us at a show or go and check out my website. My uh, web address is right here. It's uh, eshwaybijou.square.site and that will let you go shop online for some of the things that you've seen me creating in my videos but there is vastly more that you've never seen but you can see at a show and i have a show coming up as a matter of fact in ebor city at the jingle bell bazaar so please come on down for that uh, weekend i'm going to post the information the, the date and time right here and the address for ebor city and you can come down Take a look at all the really cool stuff I do. It's not just jewelry and it's not just home decor stuff, but I'm also getting to be a pretty fair hand with my uh, brother's scan and cut machine so I can offer a little more in the decor world. Signs, pillows, shirts, things of those nature. So these are the types of things that you haven't actually seen in my videos, but if you come see us in person at the show in Ybor City at the Jingle Bell Bazaar, and um, I'm going to post a little flyer right here over this that'll have all the details on it so you can see, but please come out and meet us. We'd be happy to, to chat with you for a minute, happy to talk shells or anything else, so come on down and visit. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I know everybody has lots to do on Thanksgiving weekend. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy holiday weekend schedule to come and check out my little old channel. And if you do like this kind of content and you want to see more, please go ahead and give this channel a like, a share, or a subscribe. It really helps our channel out by uh, introducing it through the algorithm to other folks that are also looking for information on the southwest gulf coast of florida's beaches as well as things they can do with those cool shells they find on those beaches have a fantastic weekend we'll see you again really soon with another adventure and i think 
I think next week we're going to take a ride over to Fort DeSoto. Check out some of the things that we found over there after Regalia. And I can already tell you it was Murex Palooza. I've got a literal bag of Murex shells, apple Murex shells. Fantastic shelling trip. Come on along and join us for the next one, and we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.